This meeting is being recorded. Okay. Um, hold on. Um, well, I, I'm going to say fi five years ago, I accepted to be convener for two years. And uh, so today I'm handing off the baton. Um, as um, as the as the convener of this group, uh, Bob Johnson and a couple of fellows have gotten together, and Bob has willingly said that he will offer leadership for the group in the future, and I'm hoping he'll join us and tell us a little bit about what he has in mind for that. But I'm very grateful to him for for doing that, and the ones that join with him in making plans for the future of Seminary Friends. I'm glad today to have Mary Jane Allen. I first remember meeting her at least as she was considering going to seminary and feeling called to ministry and uh, also uh, inquiring about places that she might be able to serve as a woman minister in our town of Chattanooga and so she has successfully done that and done well at that and uh, we're glad that she's willing to join us today thank you Mary Jane for sharing your pilgrimage and we're anxious to hear well thank you David and I appreciate the opportunity to share. Uh, I know some of your names. I may not know you personally, but um, I appreciate the opportunity to be with you. And um, I gave David my topic of uh, uh, before my life before uh, seminary, during seminary, and after seminary. So I'm going to share that part of my story with you. Uh, like probably all of you. Uh, my spiritual roots are in the Southern Baptist Convention. Uh, I've recently used the term that I was pretty much in a Baptist bubble <laughs> for a great deal of my life. My dad was a pastor. We moved when I was uh, young, very young, uh, from our home state of Texas to Northeast Arkansas and then to Southeast Missouri, where I graduated from high school uh, in Sykeston, Missouri. I wanted to go to a Baptist college. The nearest one was in West Tennessee, Union University in Jackson. Uh, it was there that I met my husband, Bill, and um, at Calvary Baptist Church. Um, we attended Broadway Baptist Church in Knoxville while, while he was finishing up his uh, work at UT. And in all of those churches, I was encouraged in leadership roles, uh, teaching Sunday school primarily, even with my peers, teaching young adults while I was a young adult. Um, I was an elementary school teacher uh, for the first part of our married life. Uh, we were in Nashville for seven years. And I must say that Belmont Heights Baptist Church was really my training ground. Um, there were a lot of members uh, there who worked at the Sunday School Board and the Tennessee Baptist Convention, and uh, uh, we met on Wednesday nights as a, with leaders of the Tennessee Baptist Convention and the Sunday School Board to prepare for teaching on Sundays back in those good old days. You all probably remember those. And then we moved to Chattanooga, and I decided to uh, discontinue teaching for a while, but at the same time, um, I was enlisted by the Tennessee Baptist Convention, Wendell Price, uh, for leadership training with adults, and eventually uh, I did that in Tennessee and then in Alabama. Eventually, I uh, worked as a, a leadership training consultant with the Southern Baptist Convention, I had a couple of opportunities to teach at Ridgecrest, which was great. And I found that I loved teaching adults. So eventually, um, I began serving as an educational coordinator at Ridgedale Baptist Church in Chattanooga and um, um, began to think about seminary um, because of all of my experiences. I was encouraged by Bill Owens, who was the pastor. He was a graduate of Southern and encouraged by my husband and friends in ministry to, to go for it. So I started seminary in my early 40s, uh, and my goal was to get a master's in Christian education. 
which was a two-year program. Uh, two years was what we felt like we could do because Bill stayed in Chattanooga. I moved to the campus in Louisville and we had a commuter marriage for a couple of years. And it was an interesting time in Southern Baptist life because the breakup was underway. I started with the J term in 1985. And uh, uh, pretty quickly, I, I wanted a part-time job and it was hard to get a job uh, in churches. Uh, but um, my part-time job was being an assistant in Dr. Honeycutt's office. And I was uh, uh, responsible for a lot of clerical tasks. I filed all of his correspondence, which was interesting, and uh, made a lot of copies of various things, especially before the board meetings. Um, this was shortly after he had mentioned in a convocation speech uh, the term holy war. <laughs> so he got a lot of interesting letters. And I was always appreciative that he was so gracious in answering every criticism and question that people had. He would highlight uh, and then that would be his basis for returning the to uh, message letter to that person. Uh, some of the people that were um, uh, professors that were uh, important to me, Mike Harton was my advisor in Christian education. Uh, John Hendricks was a wonderful Christian education professor. Um, I appreciated Gerald Cowan greatly teaching Old Testament and Bill Hendricks in theology. Uh, and thanks to all of my years in Sunday school and vacation Bible school, I was placed in advanced New Testament with Dr. Harold Songer. So do some of you remember some of those names? I see a smile on Bob's face at least. <laughs> so I did not have a class with Glenn Henson, <clears throat> but he was a presence, if you will, on that campus. Uh, you would hear things about Glenn Henson. One of the things was he walked to class every single day. Um, and that he was a contemplative. I, I remember hearing those kinds of things about him. Uh, I did go to uh, Deer Park Baptist Church uh, for a while, and he was a member there. And then um, our paths did cross later, which I'll tell you about in a minute. But um, David mentioned that, uh, you know, there were questions about what women could do after graduation. Uh, and of course, I was not on a pastoral uh, track. I was on <clears throat> an education track. But um, I came back to Chattanooga, which uh, I don't know if you know, but it's kind of known as a conservative town, still is. And um, uh, some of the ones at seminary gave us some advice about what we could do. And um, one was that we could connect with a progressive Baptist pastor. Uh, we could volunteer to be an assistant or help in any way that pastor might want. We could volunteer to work part-time, <laughs> uh, whatever we could do to sort of get our foot in the door. So um, I had been active in the association. David Myers was the uh, director of mission. So he was one of the first people I went to to ask about possibilities. And he referred me to First Baptist Church. Um, initially, I talked with Wallace Parham. Any of you know Wallace Parham? Uh, he was the education, Minister of Education at that time. Um, the first interview was kind of interesting because he wanted me to apply for uh, being the uh, youth minister, which I had no interest in doing. <laughs> and uh, they were also looking for an education secretary. And that was a no as well, of course. But um, eventually, actually, it didn't take very long. 
uh, I graduated in December of uh, 86. Eventually, I met with the pastor, Gary Carver. He had come to First Baptist while I was in Louisville. And uh, he was very interested in someone to work with young adults, both single adults and married young adults. And so I started half time. Uh, it wasn't very long. I'd say within a year or so that they moved me to three quarter time. And within a couple of years, I was working full time uh, as minister with adults. And uh, uh, Wallace Parham uh, retired and Dennis Faust, whom you may know, uh, followed him. And Dennis uh, was there, I think, for about seven years. And I followed him as minister of education. Um, I was ordained in 1995, and uh, there was not a murmur that I know of. Dennis, might, I mean, David might tell you differently, but <laughs> there was there was no murmur from the association. Uh, my father, who was uh, getting elderly at that time, worried every year when we had the associational meeting that First Baptist Church was going to get kicked out of the association because they had a ordained a woman, and I think I may have been the first staff uh, female to be ordained. I, I can't prove that, but I think Ruth Robinson, who was the editor, religion editor of the paper, I think she kind of did a little research and thought that was true. I don't know. About that. But it was interesting uh, from the very beginning, uh, in my uh, ministry there as a female Baptist minister in Chattanooga, I was rather unique. And so I had multiple opportunities to represent our church in community activities and boards. Uh, Habitat for Humanity was one of the first ones. And uh, I served on that board for a number of years. Uh, we had a Chattanooga Community Kitchen, which is just recently rebranded as Chat Foundation. Uh, but our church was a, a, one of the seven founding churches of this ministry to um, homeless and hungry. They basically started serving one meal a day. Uh, now they serve um, three meals a day, 365 days a year, and they do um, housing and um, case management, uh, foot care, <laughs> all kinds of things. It's a very holistic ministry that I'm still involved with and uh, appreciate very much. I'm uh, currently on the board and the executive committee of that ministry. So I had opportunities because, like I say, I was unique and it, it was people reached out to me to serve in some of those uh, capacities. And I was able to take advantage of educational opportunities. Um, I took CPE um, in a unique parish based uh, form. Uh, I think they only did it a couple of times, but I was able to do CPE um, and, and work with my congregation as they were hospital, I didn't actually work in the hospital other than that, but it was it was based on people who were already in a church uh, staff position. Um, lots of conferences, I took advantage of any of those that I could to continue my education. And so I began to emerge uh, from this Baptist bubble that I mentioned. And I'll tell you of some significant experiences I had uh, that helped me to do that. Uh, for a couple of years, I attended, uh, well, I'll back up. I was on a board called Interfaith Elderly Assistance. And since I worked with adults, including older adults, that was something I was interested in. So a couple of us who were on that board attended a spirituality for older adults at Canuga Conference Center. And that's an Episcopal 
Conference Center over in North Carolina. I think all the all the major denominations must have a conference center in North Carolina. I don't know. This was not very far from Ridgecrest, of course. Um, but that was a very, um, it, it was a life-changing experience. It was a very interesting conference, Spirituality for Older Adults. The woman who organized it, uh, I think she was the head of a, a nursing home. So there were uh, ministers there. There were nurses. <laughs> it was just and and there were different it wasn't just episcopalians i must say that i was one of the few baptists there of course but uh it was just very diverse and and wonderful in the way it was diverse um and i loved i found that i loved the episcopal worship that we did i loved that liturgy and and the format of that um and and uh participated as a participant in uh, a healing prayer service that I had never done before. And um, one of the really meaningful things um, was a panel discussion about grief, as you might imagine, a conference dealing with older adults. And um, it, the panel discussion included a Baptist minister who was retired, and when it was his turn to talk, he began to talk about his grief at the loss of the Southern Baptist Convention. And I was so moved to tears because I realized that I was grieving that as well. And... Um, one of the women who was who uh, well in fact the woman who rode with me to the conference was a Quaker and she and I had shared our stories um, on the way as we travel and she was sitting by me and this new Qua this Quaker friend was the one who comforted me in my grief about my own loss of my faith tradition. Uh, and this was during the time when the when we were moving through all of those term, uh, tumultuous days. So I realized in that setting that I had kindred spirits in other places other than in my own faith tradition. And that was a, a mind opening heart opening, soul opening experience for me. And I must tell you that that was 1996. And on this day in 1996, when we were gathered in a large group, they announced the death of Henry Nowen. And there was an audible gasp when that was announced. And then I, I knew I was with Kindred Spirits, but he is one of my spiritual directors through all of his books. So uh, sometime after that, uh, a close friend who was really a spiritual friend, member of our church, um, learned about uh, the Academy for Spiritual Formation that is uh, a part of the Upper Room Ministry. And she asked me, part of her application for attending this academy was a letter of reference. And so she asked me to do the letter of reference for her and gave me the information about it. And I thought, I want to do that. <laughs> I want to do that too. So I did apply for the uh, Academy for Spiritual Formation. And... Uh, I'll explain what that is and encourage you to look at their website on the Upper Room website. It's a two-year program, and the first, uh, it, it, it gets complicated explaining it, but the first year focuses on your own life of faith, and the second 
year moves to how you live that out. Okay, so what happens is that every three months, you go to a five-day retreat. Uh, and that five-day retreat follows a modified daily worship, uh, daily office with worship, morning worship, uh, evening worship, night, and then the night worship, uh, communion every day. You have two lectures every day, followed by an hour of silence after each lecture. You come back together and share with each other. At night, you're a part of a small covenant group uh, where you share your stories. You share what's happening to you during that the process of the retreat and what you're learning uh, from all of that. Um, the you have two different lectures at every retreat so you get a wide range they have an actual curriculum that you can look at that covers spiritual formation um, so in between those five-day retreats you read some assigned books you write reflections and you practice what you're learning. Um, the word that best describes it is rhythm. It's a rhythm of quarterly re retreats and the daily rhythm while you're there. And um, it was a life-changing experience for me. It transformed me personally and professionally. That's where I reconnected or connected with Glenn Henson because he uh, was a founding board member. He was one of the lecturers at times. Uh, he was the advisor to the board, to the uh, board of the academy. And um, interestingly enough, um, Johnny Sears is now the director of the Academy for Spiritual Formation. And he was mentored by Glenn Henson. And he is a CBF person. So we have a, a wonderful connection with the Academy for Spiritual Formation. And CBF has partnered uh, with, of course, Upper Room is seen to be met although it's not exactly Methodist, but we had a wonderful partnerships, CBF, with um, uh, Upper Room. Uh, we've, we've provided uh, leadership for some of the re retreats. And I will tell you that they, they do um, not only this two-year program, and they're now doing them all over the world, literally, I was in number 16, and they're up to number 42 now. Uh, they do them in various places across the country. They've done them in other countries. They've had people from other countries come and participate in, in those in our country. So in addition to the two-year program, they have five-day retreats. So you can kind of you can go to a five-day retreat and kind of see if it's something you want to do, if it fits what you want to be doing with your life and your ministry. So that was that was a wonderful experience. So um, at the end, um, Upper Room introduced Companions in Christ. Do any of you, does that ring a bell with any of you? Uh, it was a spiritual formation, uh, small group experience, uh, uh, quite lengthy. I think it seemed like there were, I forget how many weeks there were that you had to meet a uh, week. Um, but it was, it was, it was a wonderful follow up to what I had just been through. So I introduced it to our congregation and, uh, this friend that, 
there were there were three of us, I think, from our congregation that attended the same academy that I did. And we thought, well, there might, you know, we might get two or three groups that would do this, small groups. Well, we put out the information, had an introductory session, and we ended up with at least six groups who wanted to do this. Um, I actually led our staff members, pastoral staff, uh, in Companions in Christ. And I realized I had found my passion, and it was spiritual formation. Um, Daniel Vestal came for a deacon's retreat, and I showed him the information and, and then helped introduce it to CBF through Rick Bennett. Uh, Rick was brought on staff primarily to, to work um, to promote spiritual formation with CBF. So <laughs> after being a consultant with the Southern Baptist Convention, I now became a consultant with the Upper Room and uh, traveled some, went to various places, helping to train leaders. I was trained by the Upper Room, and then I went out to help train leaders to lead, lead uh, companions in Christ in their own congregations. Um, and that's a resource that is still available. They've tweaked it a little bit, but it's still available, and it's an excellent small group resource. So um, a part of that was just as I was moving into retirement, uh, Marjorie Thompson, who had been um, one of the leaders in developing uh, Companions in Christ, uh, she asked me to get a small group of people together to preview another piece of it after the basic piece. And the name of it was The Way of Discernment. So I asked a couple of women that I thought would be interested, and I put a little note in the newsletter and asked for people who might be interested in, in doing this and got a group of, I think it, we had a group of six um, to preview the way of discernment. And so I got a paper manuscript and we worked through that and we answered questions about it and reported to, to Marjorie so that they could uh, put that together, which they did. Well, when we, when we finished that assignment, uh, the women and women said, well, we don't want to quit. We want to continue. So for about 15 years, a group of women, I've met with them um, regularly, twice a month, most of the time. Uh, we would occasionally take a break during the summer, but we met together for 15 years until just recently. And uh, we had to disband because of uh, age, <laughs> for one, and some health issues it, where we couldn't meet uh, regularly. Uh, so now we meet occasionally for lunch just to check in with each other. But they're still my uh, closest friends, spiritual friends. Um, during those years, I did numerous retreats with that group of women. And sometimes I was asked to do retreats for other groups like uh, the Tennessee CBF staff um, asked me to do a retreat with them. So uh, I've enjoyed doing that kind of thing. So um, I guess you could say uh, that I have escaped the bubble, <laughs> the Baptist bubble. I'm uh, an associate of the Sisters of St. Mary at Suwannee. This is a, a small group of Episcopal nuns uh, there in Suwannee, and I'm an associate of that group. And um, I live in a retirement community, the same one that David lives in, uh, made up of Catholics, 
pre uh, Presbyterians, Methodists, Episcopalians, nuns, <laughs> N-O-N-E-S, uh, atheist, <laughs> and uh, just a smattering of Baptist. You can count us on what? Maybe definitely two hands, but sometimes one hand. <laughs> we Baptist. But um, uh, Ascension, which is the overall umbrella of Alexian Village of Signal Mountain, um, is a Catholic organization. Um, but the Protestants outnumber the Catholics here on our campus. Um, but the Catholics are definitely a, a presence. But I'm part of a centering prayer group that meets every week, uh, organized by a former nun who is my closest spiritual friend here where I live. Uh, she has a very interesting background and story, as you might imagine. Um, I serve as uh, the chair of an interfaith um, committee. Uh, we work with our Presbyterian chaplain uh, to encourage spiritual life and activities in our community. Uh, we sponsor an Advent service and a Lenten service each year uh, for the community uh, with leadership from the local pastors here in Signal Mountain. So I guess you are probably aware that we don't have ministers of education anymore. I'm always interested uh, reading uh, Baptist News Global to see the transitions and the openings. You don't see minister of education. Uh, they are uh, uh, ministers of Christian formation. Uh, and now I, I think of myself as um, I just recently got some business cards again. I hadn't had any in a while. And I put on there Christian formation and spiritual guidance because that's what I would be doing if I were going to seminary today or uh, working as a staff person in church. I think that's probably what I would want my title to be. So things have changed. As you know, church is very different, but that's uh, kind of where I'm today. I'm still active at First Baptist Church. Um, you know, if you're an Episcopalian and you're on staff, when you retire, you're out of there. You have to go somewhere else. But uh, First Baptist has been very gracious in uh, allowing me to, we took a little break when I retired. And then we came back and, and Bill and I are still very active at First Baptist Church. I'm now a deacon <laughs> and a Sunday school teacher. So uh, that's, that's kind of where I am today. But I'm open to any questions that I may have raised in some of that. I know the spiritual formation program is very rigorous and demanding. I have several friends who have gone through that program. I explored it with one of the introductory retreats that the Methodists have locally here in the East Texas area. Okay. I didn't feel like I could make that commitment, but I really <laughs> admire you for staying with it because it is a very demanding and, and you are a, an official spiritual director now that you've gone through the program. You didn't say that, but that's part of the uh, purpose of the program, right? Well, um, it doesn't have to be an outcome of the program, but I actually did, I didn't mention this, but I actually uh, followed the two-year program with uh, the Academy with a two-year program of um, spiritual direction, which was, I only attended once a year, but had a number of things that I had to compile, complete uh, to do that. So um, I am a spiritual guide in that sense. Yes. Mm -hmm. So where did you go to the five day? At, um, I forgot the name of the lake. It's East Texas here, the East Texas Methodist camp. Oh yeah, um, okay. Lake something or other. Yeah. Um, at every retreat, whether it's just the five-day or the two-year program, you you have a single room, 
And I didn't mention that silence is a big part of it. Uh, after each lecture, you have an hour of silence, and then you have silence after night prayer until morning prayer. So it's very contemplative, and, and I was very drawn to that. Not everybody is, but um, it, it met a need in my life. Mm -hmm. That's pretty hard for Baptist preachers. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Oh. My son, you talk about the titles. I'm sorry. I want to say one more thing. My grandson has just been called as um, young adult pastor at uh, what used to be First Baptist Church of Euless, Texas, which is okay. now Cross City Church. And uh, he was family pastor at First Baptist Church, Waxahachie. So they've called its pastor of such and such in many churches right. now. Right. Mary Jane, I was interested in your comment about early on taking parish based CPE and was wondering if you remember the context and who your supervisor was. For the last 30 years, I have led a parish based program out of okay. St. Matthew's Baptist Church. Okay. Olin Grubbs was the supervisor. You know Olin, I bet. I know Olin. Uh, yeah. What church was he at Crescent Hill then, or no? This was in Chattanooga, and he's in Chattanooga. Member, he's a member of our church, First Baptist in Chattanooga. Okay. And he's he's now retired, but uh, yes, I, and they didn't continue that. In fact, Erlanger, I think, has dropped CPE, they, uh, which is unfortunate. It was a great program. And Olin was one of the supervisors. And, right. Um, yeah. That fit my my schedule at the time. It was great to be able to continue to be on staff and to do CPE at the same time. So, yeah. We, we do that. Uh, Wayne Oates did a program in the 70s at uh, Crescent Hill. And okay. I, I was a part of that. And Walter Jackson and I started this program at St. Matthew's uh, in uh, 92. Good. I I think it's it's a it's a good thing to do. You know, most of the CPA students are that we get in that we used to get in at Erlanger and Chattanooga were from uh, the University of the South in Sewanee or from Lee University in Cleveland. But we had a, a very vital CPE program. Um, well, I have a question about that. A uh, part of our CPE is spiritual formation and personal formation right? And, and how that relates to ministry. How did your CPE emphasis on spiritual formation uh, fit with what you're doing as a spiritual director? Glenn and I have had this conversation many times. I'd be interested in your reflection. Um, well, it was, it was a part of the curriculum of the, of the program. Um, and, and I think that it's very important. A, a lot of pastors, I think, don't uh, take spiritual formation uh, as seriously as they should for themselves and for the congregation. I know that pastors are stretched to the limit uh, with the responsibilities they have, especially these days uh, when staffs are smaller and um, they have so much on their plates. But, you know, it's really basic to, to who we are as Christians that we have a, um, a personal, very personal uh, relationship on a daily basis and, uh, with God. And um, mm -hmm. um, I just think it's, it's, it's vital. So I'm glad to see uh, the change from Christian education, so so much that, oh, to spiritual formation, uh, Christian development, or whatever you want to call it, but mm -hmm. that's very important, and I'm glad to see that there are staff people doing that these days. From co from cognitive information to a spiritual and holistic integration is the way we right. talk about it. Ray Bailey, in a published article several years back, said personal spiritual formation and daily devotion was mm -hmm. the key 
to invigorating preaching and to uh, a, a sense of bondedness with one's congregation. Mm -hmm. How would you speak to that? I would totally agree with that. I do think that's true. Um, Has it affected your teaching? I, I might. Oh, very much so. And I haven't mentioned that <laughs> I, I'm a, a reader. So I mentioned here and now, and, but a lot of my spiritual guides are authors. Uh, I read Richard Rohr regularly. Um, I still love all of Henry Nowen's books. Um, I read um, uh, Margaret Gunther, um, uh, Joan Chittister. Those are one of them, some of the Episcopalian ones, a Catholic. So I read broadly in that area. Um, so it, it I, I don't uh, necessarily focus on it, but I think it's a part of who I am and how I teach. It's a lot of journaling uh, and yes. reflection then on the journal in the meetings. Do you use journaling and do you have a method of doing that? Um, I have several boxes of legal pads that I've journaled on through the years. I don't do it in detail as much that, you know, I've changed a little in how I do that um, and maybe don't do it as much. I probably should get back to it more, but I think one of the things is that there are so many spiritual practices and so many ways that you can uh, meditate and contemplate. And um, I find it helpful to, to change up a little bit. I focus, uh, I'm very much into Celtic spirituality. So I have a Celtic daily prayer book that I use sometimes. Um, but I use the worship book that we had in the academy and, you know, I, I move around from thing to thing, but yeah. And I think the more you saturate yourself in all of that, the more it's a part of who you are. So. You mentioned the variety. Corinne Ware, uh, Episcopalian, uh, says that the variety ties directly to our personality types. Mm -hmm. Were you trained in understanding the the Myers Briggs or any personality types as you sought to individualize spiritual direction for individuals? Uh, I have done that a little bit. Looked at how the the Myers Briggs fits you and how you need to. Um, you're drawn to certain kinds of meditation but you can also um, move in another direction and increase um, the way that you uh, live spiritually. So, I was interested in George's comment about Baptist preachers have trouble with silence. And many, <laughs> many of us, uh, Chuck Bug, the, the leader of the pack, are extroverts, and uh, si silence is difficult for us. Mm-hmm. Well, I think it's interesting that they say that a lot of ministers are introverts, and I really am. I value my quiet time, my solitude. Uh, we push ourselves, if we're an introvert, to do what we have to do as a minister. Uh, but it's true, yeah. And maybe the extroverted preachers are the ones that really need to go to the academy. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> uh, at least try five day like uh, George did and see if it fits. And if it doesn't, that's okay. You know, we're all different. So, yeah. I'd like to hear what some of you do for your spiritual self. <laughs> you jump in one, with one other thing uh -huh. along that line is the walk to Emmaus. Um, my wife and I have been involved in that for 30 years. Yes. And it's been a very enriching experience. I still meet with my reunion group. Uh, uh, three of the guys have moved away, but we have our reunion group by Zoom. And so uh -huh. we stay in contact and it's a weekly accountability thing. But if you haven't explored the walk to Emmaus, it was a transforming experience in my spiritual journey. Yes, yes. I, I have not done that, but I've heard exactly 
those exact same reflections on that. Another good Methodist <laughs> thing, so I'm glad we can share. <clears throat> I think Chuck is talking, but we can't hear him. There. I'm sorry. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Okay. Um, Wade and I have taught together, so we're used to interrupting each other. Uh, <laughs> so while he was talking, I was uh, trying to interrupt him. What I wanted to ask you, uh, Mary Alice, I, number one, I share your love for Henry Nowen. Um, my daughter lived with her family in Toronto, and I had a chance to visit the large community in uh, where Henry now had been. He had passed away when I was there. But uh, mm. what I would what I would like to ask you is, you know, one of the things I'm concerned about is when we use the ordinary metrics of the church, and maybe we need to. Maybe we need to change metrics, but the fact is that the church is in precipitous decline, most churches. How, how is what you're doing, how can that uh, change people and bring them into the church? Obviously, we're not doing something that we need to do, or we're just, uh, you know, uh, moving the same direction as Great Britain and Canada and now the United States. But I'm interested in how we can draw people in uh, with what you're doing. Have you worked on that? Uh, that is a huge question that I don't think I'm capable of answering. Um, I'm not sure. This is just a different day uh, in the church. Uh Phyllis Tickle is another person that I yeah. read and actually met. Uh, um, she said many, many years ago that by 2020, the church wouldn't look anything like it did. And we're past that now. And she didn't even know we were going to have a pandemic that changed everything, too. But it's it's just a very difficult um question to answer. Um, I think um, small group activities like the Companions in Christ, if people will commit to doing that, that's a, a great way to do it. Uh, there are other small groups that meet as well. I was having a discussion with a Presbyterian friend uh, this week who was really touting small groups. And of course, a lot of our Sunday school groups are small groups now, you know, but um, I, I do think that the Bible study is important, but as much as we can, we should be encouraging people to develop their own um, inner life. Um, I used to uh, be concerned about older people who, um, just bemoan the fact that, that they had gotten to a point in their health, that they, their physical condition, that they couldn't go to church. And I worried that a lot of them didn't have the inner resources that they needed to uh, worship by themselves. Community worship, of course, is very important. I truly mm -hmm. believe in that. But, um, I, I wish that that um, older people could know that you know I can I can worship every day um, with God and and even if I'm not able to be in the community and of course uh, nowadays uh, at least our church you can watch the service on Facebook or YouTube so you're a part of it in that sense. Um, so I don't know if some of the rest of you may have a better answer than that. From <laughs> that's that's a tough one, I think. How how we how we continue to keep people involved and in growing. Uh, I th I think it's uh, such an insight that 
that you are talking about uh, growing internally, growing spiritually, whereas a lot of churches that are in decline are just ramping up activities uh, to see how many more things they can do without that spiritual dimension that you're talking about. Um, so I appreciate what you what you shared. Thank you. <clears throat> Hi, Mary Jane. This is Bob. Hey, Bob. I'm going to tell them something you didn't tell them about yourself. Okay. He's also a good uh, funeral presider and preacher. Uh, I was unable to come to Chattanooga when my brother-in-law died last year. And I cast about through David Meyer and we came up uh, with you, your name and you graciously did the funeral for my brother-in-law. And fortunately, uh, she had been a customer of his when he owned a shell station out on I-75. And so uh, Mary Jane was very much appreciated by our family and especially me uh, as she came to our rescue. And I listened to it online and she did a very good job and we appreciated it so much. And the other thing is I had the privilege of being Mary Jane's pastor for a year when I was their intentional interim at First Baptist Chattanooga and learn to appreciate her and wish I'd had more time to get to know her better. But uh, she had a good reputation in the church. So I learned a lot about her from others. Okay. So thank you, Mary Jane. And I will say this, Chuck, in, in answer to your question, I'm not a CPE guy. I didn't even know what it was. I got friends with Wade Rowett and I learned something from Wade. Uh, I was just a country preacher from East Texas. And, uh, but I've been fortunate in getting aside in my relationships. And when I was, when I taught in the seminary, I had a statistic that I had come across and I think it's probably still close to true that the people in the church, that the church reaches, 5% uh, of them are reached by the pastor. The others are reached through friendship and kinship. Mm -hmm. And I see what you're doing as falling into the friendship category. And I know it's hard to enlist people because this is a, a rigid requirement you've talked about. But just think about what we could do if we had a few people that then could be multiplied as time goes by, they'd be much uh, better church members and so I don't know, that's just, uh, I don't know, I don't know what the answer to that is. I know that our church, Broadway Baptist, is back up to where we were in attendance before COVID. But before COVID, we were still about half of what we were 30 years ago when I came. Mm -hmm. But we have 400 and something people who listen online. So we're in a way reaching more people than we were before. And uh, I don't know what counts with God. I think we have to have a new way of counting, probably. <laughs> anyway, that's all I'll say. <laughs> you're, you're muted, David. David, you're muted. Okay. Um, I had said before you came and before a number of others came that as I was bowing out as convener, that you had graciously decided to, to help you and a couple of others had talked about the future of seminary friends. And before the session is over, cause I'm gonna have to leave early. Um, I would like for you to share with the group, okay. um, what, uh, what you're thinking about. And I would also say that, uh, uh, if there are others who want to step up to offer some leadership and be a part of that, uh, be sure to step forward. Let Bob know. Oh, thank you, David. Uh, uh, David contacted me. I'm not sure. I don't remember whether he wrote everybody or just me on the side. 
uh, talking about his need to uh, give up a job that he'd held longer than anyone else. You do hold that record. I decided to, to help David. I made some suggestions and then uh, I gathered together uh, Wade Rowett and David Sapp and Larry McSwain to have a Zoom meeting about a, an idea to respond to David. Here's what we came up with and what we're willing to do. And let me preface that by saying, if anyone would like the job that David is giving up, uh, I sure don't want it again like it is. Because uh, I did it three years and our decline started under me. You all might remember that we had 70 and 80 and then we got down to 50 and I forgot uh, maybe less than that on the last one. Anyway, the decline started under me. It didn't, it didn't start under Floyd. He, he still was running it like a Sun School enlargement campaign. <laughs> anyway, our, uh, our consensus is that we need to look at a two-year existence and then a royal funeral for, for our group. And if anyone wants to uh, take it and see what you can do with it beyond that, we'll be glad to step aside. Uh, but I, I think all of us will only serve <clears throat> if the group accepts that idea. And again, I can't be offended. I'd be thrilled if it could go on forever. Uh, and then uh, our suggestion on programs to fit that is to, to um, have either deans or presidents of the new seminaries that have some connection with Southern Seminary to be our programs. And so we already have some names lined out and a tentative person who would do our November meeting, we're recommending an every other month, not every month. Now that's where we are. And if somebody wants to take leadership it's yours. Thank you, Bob. It sounds like Mary Jane and David had talked and have a plan, too. We might hear what they had come up with. <laughs> no. This is our plan today. <laughs> this, <laughs> this is it. it. <laughs> what, what you, Wade, talk to me about what you mean. If I can interrupt, this is Floyd Roebuck. Uh, I was Cabino for a while one time. And we were, back in those days, we um, had our meeting, uh, of course, uh, that on Friday night and Saturday, uh, every year, every fall. And the fellowship with people and seeing old friends again was very important there. And already we, we aren't doing that. Uh, you know, things have changed. Uh, those of us who remember the old Southern, um, we we're all about dead. Um, the, um, I guess I'm the oldest one still left, uh, certainly the oldest former uh, convener, uh, and I'm 93. So you know at this stage I'm not going to be around for a long time, although my health is good at the moment. So what I'm, what I'm saying is, is there any way we could co incorporate some kind of get-together uh, as a group? Maybe as the final act of the group, I don't, I don't know. Um, back up at uh, Berea, and one more time of looking at it. Or is that too much to ask? Or are we too old and too busy to do that kind of thing anymore? Um, I, I like the Zoom concept, and of course Andy has been the technician behind all of this. He's terrific, um, but. Maybe a final, you said uh, something about a celebration or something in two or three years, Bob. I'm not sure. A grand, what you a grand, a grand funeral. Yeah, a grand funeral. We, we, we do it in person. Is that your concept? I, I in two years, I, I won't go. I won't go to a, a, a meeting anymore. I, I'm very comfortable. I have my own comfort zone. I, I I'm not up for that. So if someone else wants to drive take to, it. Yeah, you can let me drive to Berea. Uh, I still drive. I'm fortunately able to do I that. I drive. I'm not going to drive. 
fit. <laughs> anyway, uh, it was it's been a great thing, and sometimes we do have to have the grand funeral. I'm I'm not opposed to that idea, but I the fellowship was one of the big angles. And Ann and I, when we used to go up there every year, it was a chance to go back to Kentucky, back to Louisville, uh, back to old familiar scenes and memories. And I miss that, although I don't expect to ever have be able to do it again. That, that That's all. I, that's what I'm thinking about. How could that be worked into the end of the group? I think the group has died. We knew all along that demographics would get us eventually. And it, they have. Um, we are, if you look at who's here today, gosh, I have found uh, this week uh, an old graduation program from Southern Seminary when one of you guys uh, was getting his PhD. Uh, his name is something like Wade Roy. <laughs> and the reason I found that, I <laughs> had a flood inside my house when a pipe burst and so on. I've replaced all the floors in my house. And moved a lot of stuff around, and I found the graduation program. And Wade Rowett got his PhD at the same service where I got my D men. I was one of the earlier D men, but Wade's had his half a century, and, and he was no spring chicken when he got it. Where are you, Wade? Hmm. Yeah, I'm gonna get a response from him. And basically, it had hurt. Well, well, he's maybe gone. He's already left us. All right. Anyway, I'm, I'm still I, here. I, 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 I amen. I'm no spring chicken. <laughs> Hello, so, Wade. Our, our idea is for this group of four, and if any of you want to join us, uh, we will lead in the way that we have suggested. Otherwise, uh, none of us wants to do it. And I, I wouldn't dare predict what I could do in two years from now. We agreed we would be a committee of four to get programs every other month for the next two years, if that's acceptable. And that uh, after that, if someone wants to step up, Mary Jane is much younger than the rest of us. I think she graduated in the late to mid 80s. Uh, so may, maybe maybe there will be someone who wants to step up and be convener and get programs after this. But after two years, we certainly need to either have a grand funeral, reevaluate. The four of us are willing to be a committee uh, for the for the next two years. And I apologize, Mary Jane, for chopping off the conversation because <laughs> I've got to leave. But I wanted Bob to be sure to talk about that before we finished. So I apologize to all of you for that because <laughs> no, it's no a good problem. discussion about spiritual. Let me yeah. make a I'm one of the youngest group here. I'm, this is only my second meeting uh, to know about it, actually. Um, I graduated in 62. Um, and uh, so uh, it's been a long time ago. Uh, I appreciate so much um, what Mary Jane had to say about grieving the loss of our denomination. I'm a part of a, of a small group here in Birmingham uh, that someone like John Lee Taylor, who has just recently died, was a part of uh, John Harris, uh, Jack uh, Brammer, uh, a number of people who uh, uh, we were a part. We're down now to four of us. Uh, and I'm the youngest one of the four. Uh, mm -hmm. So um, we, uh, you know, I, I appreciate the Zoom opportunity, but at some point uh, you get to the point where you um, you can't physically go on. Um, but boy, I sure do uh, miss the spiritual vitality of of a group uh, like this, and I appreciate that. And I and I appreciate George. He just kind of come back in the picture again, but um, uh, there is some. A need for something, whether this becomes the focal point or not, uh, I don't know what. Uh, uh, we got tired of of having a funeral for the convention every time we got together. Uh, mm -hmm. But um, anyway, that's uh, just one observation. Buddy, I, I appreciate that. that. Excuse me, I wait. appreciate that, buddy. And I, I think the commitment to move forward two years will give us time to see. And one reason we were going to ask some of the new seminary deans and presidents was to turn the direction from the past into what's going on in the future 
and what is happening out there. And there's some good things happening. Sure. Mm -hmm. That sounds good, Wade. Uh, I'm probably the oldest graduate still around. I first graduated there my first time was 1951. That was four or five years ago. Um, so I guess I'm the oldest one. And I'm not the oldest alumnus, I suspect, but I'm close to it. And one of the few that's still able to move around. Anyway, let's, I would say let's do what Wade and the group is talking about and, and anticipate the demise uh, and do whatever we, is appropriate, whatever we feel our needs are. I enjoyed the fellowship with you guys and women and so on that were there. It was a great, it was a great experience. We was, it was a homecoming at Beulah in the middle of the summer with dinner on the ground. Only we did serve it in the banquet hall. Uh, anyway, 65 to 70 people at that meeting, you remember? Well, anyway, thank you all for planning ahead and thank you for this day. And I, every time I come, I think uh, back to what Andy has done for us. And Andy, I want to salute you again uh, for being the one that makes it happen technically. Uh, you've done it from the beginning. And I remember asking you about being the uh, convener, and you didn't want it. Then, can we change your mind? <laughs> okay. Anyway, uh, glad to see all of you again, the, even seeing it, you this way. The commitment is the committee will be the group, and I will be kind of the ball guy, the leader part of that, and <laughs> and handle. Uh, a little bit of what David's been doing, but but not but only just to make sure we keep going. And uh, my thought is, as Wade said, to talk about um, the, uh, the the life that has been spun off out of necessity and and uh, out of uh, enemy action and. Uh, I have tentatively arranged for Robert Canoy, whom I've known for many, many years, a PhD graduate uh, from Southern and the Dean of the Theology School at Gardner Webb. He will be our first speaker. And he has a tremendous story to tell. That school has done well. And uh, there are Southern people, Gerald Cowan was there, you remember, uh, the, the woman who taught sign language at Boyce when we had a program for the deaf, uh, she may still be working, I think. She's, she's there. And uh, so, so the life of Southern is still very much alive at Gardner-Webb and all, and all of these other places too. And then uh, just thinking ahead, I can't matter, I can't think of anybody better to do the funeral, to plan the funeral, uh, the memorial service than Dennis Faust. <laughs> so mm -hmm. I think, can you remember how well he did with uh, communion when we did communion? So he could do communion and and lead us in a service. So I, our thought, I think, was to celebrate the life that's still out there, Southern, in these other people, and then have a have a good time. And then there's nothing wrong if somebody wants to maintain the zoom we've got an email uh, uh list that can be maintained and if you want to have a meeting and talk about something or just shoot the breeze that, you can do that that wouldn't be a bit of problem and i'm sure many of us would love to just get on and talk to each other and so Rob, what date did you and robert canoy set for the november meeting november 9 this year Yes. This year? Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, think th I think this is a great idea, and I appreciate uh, all of you doing this. Um, can, can you hear me? Um, yes, sir. Okay. I, I just, I'm going to have to go, and I just wanted, before I left, to say to Mary Alice, uh, um, not Mary Alice, Mary Jane, Mary yeah, right. Jane. Mary Jane. Mary Jane. Yeah. Uh, Mary Jane, thank you for being with us. And uh, thank you for uh, all the really good things you shared with us. Today. Yeah. I, I appreciate that. Thank I, you. It's thank been a pleasure.
Yes, thank you, Mary Jane. Yes, thank her you. Spirit, her spirit has gotten her through yeah. a lot of this. She's she's bent toward this way of doing it. <laughs> well, I do want to say hello to Joyce Wyatt. I saw her show up on the screen, and she and I go yeah. back a ways. So hello, Joyce. It's so good to see you. <laughs> yeah, Joyce, and, you're muted. Uh, let's... You're We'll have more to say about David, but let's all give him a good thanks uh, for what he's done. <laughs> How many years has it been, David? Yeah. Five? Yeah. yeah. You're muted. Berea <laughs> meeting, muted. and then since then, it's been on Zoom. Yeah. Yeah. So as far as I know, you're officially uh, retired. Yes. <laughs> Okay. tired and retired <laughs> and if, if any if you want to make and i thank andy Robert, for his his work through this i've i've contacted oh, yeah. him many many times about all of this <laughs> right thank and you we andy. Will still depend on andy yeah so and if you have some joyce was i think joyce was trying to say something and she's muted so we missed yeah. her i Can want I, to now now here we now. go is now we can hear you Oh. No, no, mute yourself. No. Okay. no, do it one more now. now Mary now. Jane, yes. Okay. I just wanted to say how good it is to see you. We worked together for Tennessee Baptist Women in Ministry for years. Yes. And so yes. I think we had uh, a wonderful result in doing that. And I bemoan that we do not have that organization as it was at that time. So, so good to see you. Thank you for today. It's great to see you, Joyce. And even though we don't have that organization, um, the women in our state were very involved in our coordinating council. And yes. uh, the younger generation is doing it their own way. And that's great, too. Yeah. That's a wonderful thing. Yes. But it's a pleasure working with you, Joyce. Thank you, my dear. <laughs> Mary Jane, you may know there's a very robust group in Kentucky of women in ministry, and yes. they give an annual award to the church that uh, supported women in ministry in the past year. Yes. Well, uh, our coordinating council does that as well. Tennessee, uh, yes. the Betty Galloway Award, she was the first female deacon ordained at Oak Ridge Baptist Church. And um, so we give an award every year to one or two people or churches who encourage women in ministry. So, yes. Can you send me some information about that? Sure. Just email it to me at row at GW at Gmail. Thank you. Okay. I'll try to do that. Well, thank you so thank much you for your uh, wise and personal uh and deep sharing today. It was very stimulating. Well, thank you. It was a it was a right. pleasure with you all. As I said, I know most of your names, but had not met, don't know some of you personally, but thank you for inviting me and I enjoyed being a part of the discussion. Yes. Uh, and Jane, we're gonna here. make you a member. Uh, <laughs> uh, you'll get an invitation to the next meeting, okay? Uh, I'm, I tune in to it. Okay. And this discussion will be available on um, on YouTube along with the others. We actually have a playlist and uh, you can click uh, on it and uh, follow all of the presentations from the last several years. So they'll all be there. So thank you all for coming and thank you, Mary Jane. Absolutely. Peace. <laughs> so long. <laughs>